of applause for that. Let's give a little round of applause for that. Come on. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joel Huss, the pastor here. We're continuing our summer series on unexpected heroes, unexpected grace, and looking at Ruth today. Um, and what a beautiful role model of faithfulness. Um, and I've been also proclaiming the points to you. Jesus is so much about your ears. Another. Let's do a little how you doing. You can shake hands, hug, whatever you want to do. Uh, we're all good here and good to have you here. And let's have a little time of silence before we begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the only innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sensitive woman. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant to the word, announce the grace of God to all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, forgive you of all your sins, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and we praise you for your faithfulness even to us, sending your Son to take on our shame and our guilt and even our mortality. And in him we are forgiven. And in him we have resurrection. We have an eternal hope. Lord, help us to trust in that and from that position be faithful to others, be loving to others, laying down our life for others. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the Word of God. Good morning. The Old Testament reading today is from Ruth, chapter 1. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her, to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more. Also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. This is the word of the Lord.
Gospel according to St. Mark, the 14th chapter. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. The flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping. Their eyes were heavy. They didn't know what to answer him. He came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. A uh, little children's message. Do we have any little people out there? I heard some people earlier. All right, I like it. Yes, and fast too. I think we need to start have races because this morning, first service, we had some fast kids as well. All right, good morning. What's what's up? You okay? Woo. How are we doing here? All right, yes. I wonder. Anybody else gonna mull me over here? Okay. Good morning. How's summer going? Funnest thing you've done so far? Anything? Pool movies. Pool. Anybody else? I did some camping. You guys ever camped before in a tent? I got my tent on my car. Can you imagine that? Pretty cool. Yeah, it was a ladder. Does it sound like fun? Huh? Pretty cool, yeah. So, anyhow, uh, <laughs> do your parents tell you that they're going to do, do stuff for you? What kind of stuff do they do for you? I should say that. What do they do for you? What do mom and dad do for you? Pray, I want pray for you. Good. Did they? Did you eat breakfast this morning? They took care of you there, right? Make you some food. They apparently took you swimming, right? Mom and dad say, "I'm going to take care of you," and they do. Also, do you know this too? Let's see. Um, can you always count on your? Can you always count on your mom, your grandparents? You can, can't you, right? What about you? Do people count on you? Do they, do they count on you caring for them and doing nice things to them? I think so. What about at home? Does anybody at home kind of count on you? How about mom? Does she count on you to do what she says? Yeah. Or if you have a brother, you have any friends? Who's got some friends? I think you all do. Do they count on you to be nice to them? Yeah, you got to be there for people, right? But are we always right there for everybody? Do we, all, do we always really take care of one another? We try, but do we all the time? Maybe not. Do you always take care of your sister all the time? Yeah, not always, do we? Who is always faithful? Who always comes through? God, right? He says he's going to do something, and he does, right? He promises, and he makes it happen. He takes care of us. What's the ultimate act of God, like coolest thing that he did that showed, man, he's really serious about loving me. 
Yeah, he died on the cross for everybody, right? Even for our sins, even for people that aren't so nice like me sometimes, right? Isn't that cool? God is always there. You can count on God, can't you? And you know what? Your parents count on God too. I know they seem very strong and they got it all together, but we don't all the time. We need God too. Did you know that? Thank goodness, right? Isn't that cool? All right, let's say a prayer. Dear Jesus, thanks for your promises. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thanks for your love. Help me to love others. In Jesus' name. Oh, man. Good to have you up here. Good job. You okay? All right. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Please grab a pew. It's kind of a cheesy story. you probably heard it before, but it just still kind of makes you kind of cry. When you think about this, so there's a couple of stories like this. But for sure, there's this one fellow uh, who had a service dog in the army. He was in World War II, and they were tights, the two of them, and they had been through so much, and the war ends. And, and uh, like some service members, they get to take the dog home, and so he did, and uh, that dog was faithful. And finally, this man dies, and they bury him, and uh, his kids go and look for his dog. Um, and could not find it. Nowhere in the house. Must have ran away. And they go to the guy's uh, tombstone to the graveyard, and there is the dog sitting right there at the tombstone. Always faithful. And that's dogs, isn't it? Always there. 
I'm not going to say that this guy treated him perfectly, probably not like all of us. We're not the best masters, and yet dogs are kind of cool because they uh, are faithful to you, right? When nobody else is, maybe. And they'll listen to you. I can go on and on, right? <laughs> About how dogs are better than human beings. Anyhow, and it is cool, and it's beautiful, and it really is almost miraculous um, how dogs do this. But you know, ultimately, it really is how we are called to live as human beings. It really is. Not, not like dumb like dogs in that way, but the sense of faithfulness and loyalty and commitment to one another. It is the foundation to society. It is the foundation to marriage, public commitment, greater than love, because I think love flows from and grows from commitment, following through, etc. We all need this. You need to have a healthy marriage. You need to have a healthy life to have people that are just that committed to you. They're always there for you. But when it comes to us, we don't always want to be there for, for others, right? It's so important. And today's lesson we see is we've been going through all these these characters of, of the Bible, these real people, we've got Ruth who just exemplifies this. You know, I use the word commitment. Forget that word. It's far greater than that. I, I like to raise you above, myself too, above simply obligation and commitment and to love, the kind of love we see here with Ruth. You know, when we look at all these characters, they all have the same thing in common. As we read the story of Ruth and go through this, it's always the same thing. If you have, I hope you've seen this. They come from nothing and nowhere. God always begins from nothing and nowhere and makes something awesome out of it. And Ruth is another example. Let's look at it. Uh, it was right before 1 Samuel. Uh, and I'll just read it here. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So we talked about David last week. This is before David, okay? So Moses brings the people of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, act of God, freedom, and brings them to their own land. Well, when they came there, God ruled them through the tabernacle that he set up, that went wherever they went. So God was their king, in a sense, and he ruled through various judges. And they acted as judges, as in in fact, back then, like in general, and maybe in a sense now, we were, so we're used to the three uh, offices, you know, the uh, three, uh, what's the official, the, three, the president, the executive, judicial, legislative, right? Well, a king would be like all things in some sense, right? So they'd be judge. So they call him a judge, but overall, they'd be a leader, and they'd be one who listened to the Lord. So they themselves were underneath God. Anyhow, that happened for a couple hundred years, and then... Samuel was born. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And he uh, is the last judge, and he anoints David as king. But this is the time before David. So they're in Israel. Everybody knows about Moses, how awesome God is, and brought them there. And apparently there's a famine in the land, um, which is not unusual. We understand and should understand famines. Uh, and this happens a lot, by, by, by the way, if you're re reading the Bible. There's a famine, and then people have to move to where there's food. So there's a famine in the land, and this fella who is from, notice where he's from, he's a man of Bethlehem in Judah. Do you recognize that name? He's from Bethlehem. This is not insignificant or coincidence. So he's from Bethlehem, and uh, he has a wife and two sons, and he, they go to Moab, which is across, it's not my favorite state, Utah, Moab, because I don't think that's where you should go to find food, by the way, uh, that, part of, that part of Utah. But Moab actually originally is right next to Israel. You cross the Jordan River and you come into Moab. So you go over there. It's a foreign country for them. They speak a different language, but that's where the food is. And he brings his wife. His wife's name is Naomi. I love that name. Both these names, Ruth and Naomi. So Naomi's there, and uh, what happens? Her husband dies, and she's left with two sons. Now, you'll see again, have you noticed a theme here in the Bible? Everywhere, 
Old Testament, New Testament, God loves widows, orphans, the poor, the nobody, the weak. The joke is, you're that, the barren. Here is this widow. And people oftentimes are like, boy, back then, really tough to be a widow because now you don't have your man who is your connection to your community also has the money, the breadwinner, the maker. Yeah, kind of. I mean, that's kind of true. The welfare system was family back then. And it was a successful welfare system or should have been. God oftentimes got mad at the people of Israel because they were not being the welfare system they're supposed to be taking care of the widows and orphans. But I think that we can relate. It's not like, oh, back then it'd be tough to be a widow. It's tough to be a widow now, right? <laughs> just to deal with death, the loss of someone you love, but also just the, the social stability. You don't have your husband and vice versa. It's not good today. You can relate to Naomi. And she's got two sons. They get married. Wow, cool. Connection. Because also this, she's a foreigner in Moab. So it makes sense. Her husband's gone, and now she doesn't have, the, the connections are gone. And she's in a foreign country. But she has two sons, and they get wives from Moab. And that probably gives her that connection to the Moabites, etc. And then what happens? Her sons die. And now it's three widows. Oh my goodness, what's God going to do? Man, if God loves one widow and does great things, we have three widows now. Something awesome is about to happen. So three widows. This is terrible. They're in a foreign country, especially for Naomi. You want to get married, and today you would want to get remarried. It would stink. You can relate. <laughs> Nothing's changed for the last two, three, four thousand years of human society. We've improved a little. We have iPhones now. Last year, I think we realized, holy cow, we we're just as close to craziness as they were 2,000 years ago. How alone Naomi must have felt in a place that's not her own, without a husband anymore, and now without sons. You know how that feels? I bet you do. Be somewhere you don't feel comfortable. When we moved here four, or three years ago, it'll be three years ago in, in October, it's strange. It's, it's not a good feeling to not really know anyone. You pray that you'll get through that, but they're in another language, they're in another culture. And this last year, too, I think a lot of people experienced that loneliness when things kind of broke down with the pandemic, with the political upheaval and the chaos, and people separated. And we live in a city packed full of people, but I believe there's far more lonely people in this packed city than there is in small towns with just 100 people. Are you like that? Can you relate to Naomi feeling strange? And I think there's all kinds of reasons why people feel strange and alone and a foreigner. And it might be their own sins that separate them. They can't show their face or their own feelings and they just feel weird and they are uncomfortable with their own skin. These are real people. More loneliness in America than there's ever been despite all the possibilities we have to erase that. All the social media said it, we're just more and more lonely. Because we're no different than we were back then. Sin and death cause separation and dysfunction and weirdness and foreignness and loneliness. So here is Naomi. Everything bad that could happen has happened. And she looks at her daughters. And she says, turn back my daughters. Remember, they're from Moab. Why will you go with me? Because she decides to go back to her country. She knows how things work there. And she's got family there. So she will find help there. Her family's there. That was the welfare system back then. And they kiss and, and they lifted up their voices and they wept. And they said to her, no, we're going to return with you to your people. So both of them, two daughters, Orpah, not Oprah, by the way, or Okra, Orpah, 
and Naomi uh, and Ruth. So they both say, we're never going to leave you. You know how those exchanges are, by the way, when someone gives you something and you have the little, like a dinner, you have a fake exchange. I'll pay for it. No, I'll pay for it. I'll pay it. And you're hoping that, you know, that person's going to say, I'll take care of it. And you finally relinquish. Sometimes you get stuck with the bill. Anyhow, they're doing that, right? No, we're going to go with you, right? So they go through that pattern. Uh, and then she says, listen, why will you go with me? I've got nothing for you. I'm not going to help you. I'm just a burden to you. I don't have any sons right now for you to marry. And if I did, even she said, right now, it would be how many years? Are you going to wait that long? No, go back to your life. This is what she's saying. Back to your connections. I'm going to go back to my family. You stay here. Orpa kisses her and leaves. And it's okay, by the way. She's not bad. She's fine to do that. Naomi has released her officially, lovingly. We're good. It's okay. And she goes, and she does. And it's, again, I want you to really see this. It's okay for her to go. What would you have done? Really? And then Ruth doesn't go. She clings to Naomi. She could have gone and still be righteous and a good person. It's not like, Naomi's not in the middle of nowhere. She's got a plan. Naomi says, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people. Remember that word, to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Go back where it's comfortable. That's good for you. But Ruth said this, listen to this. Now remember, this all begins with a man from Bethlehem. Ruth says these words that some men from Bethlehem say, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you for where you go, I'm going to go. Where you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Ruth goes beyond commitment. She could have left and that would have been fine. But she lays down, I want you to see this, she lays down her life for Naomi. She makes Naomi's life more important than hers, not equal. Jesus talks about love and he says, the Greeks, if you love your friends or you love people who love you back, that's easy. That's not the kind of love Jesus is talking about. It's fine, by the way, but that's normal. That's expected. But the Christ's love, godly love, is not equality or transaction or we're both equally are in this together, but it is 100% to you. It is laying down your life for someone else. It is losing yourself for someone else. That is love. We usually use this passage oftentimes for marriage ceremonies. I think it's a great passage, by the way, for a wedding. Because again, the foundation of a good relationship, that's why you get married before you go further or more intimate in your relationship. Not because God said so. Or a piece of paper does something. It's because you should publicly commit to someone that you're never going to leave them before you start getting deeper into a relationship and waste your time. And when you have that commitment, I will never leave you, not if you do this or that for me, by the way, as a wedding vow. No, it's not. I will love you if, as long as, no. I am publicly telling everyone that's all a marriage is, is all it is. That's why it doesn't have to be in church or by pastor. I will never leave you. You know what that changes in your brain when it comes to peace and security in your relationship? It frees you. 
to not be afraid to, to tell that person more, to invest in money, things, time, have kids, to go to work and have that sense of commitment that that person is crazy in love with you, not emotionally, which is nice, but will do you well, will serve you, will nur I love saying this to couples too. The vow is not, I'm not going to leave you for another girl. That's not, the, that's not sexy. That's not a romantic vow. The vow is, I'm going to make your life better, is what a marriage vow is. I'm going to nourish you. It's proactive, not, hey, Boy, he really likes me. He said he's never going to leave me. I, no, that sounds clingy even, actually. No, the vow is I'm going to lay down my life to you in little ways and big ways. That is good for your brain. That's good for your society. And Ruth is doing that. And again, this is not just for weddings, my friends. The love we're called to, even 1 Corinthians, that cheesy 1 Corinthians 13 verse, is for everybody to lay down, not to seek equality. That's important. Equality is good for the government. It's fantastic, by the way. I love it. I love our Constitution, et cetera, and its, and its virtue. But that's not actually the church. The church isn't interested in equality, but something far better. That is absolute service to one another. That is actually seeing other people as greater than you actually wanting their life to go better than yours, actually living a life of how can I make you happier? That's love. That is service. That's what Ruth does here. And that's what we need from one another in a marriage or in friendships or in a society. Our is breaking down society. But we fail at it, though. Who here can say you would do this for your mother-in-law? Unless she's sitting next to you right now. We fail at this. Even in our own marriages where we're in love with the person, we live 50-50, we live transactional, and, and we don't live with our eyes always open as to how can I make your life better. Even in our virtue sibling world that, that we talk a lot about love, we talk a lot about everybody and caring for people, and that really is good. At the same time, it just seems like we're even doing that just to serve ourselves, to look good, our own interests, to get what we want. We leave marriages because it's not serving us. We tell our, our, our kids, you know, I hope you find someone that makes you happy. And to some degree, I get that, but that's really not the ultimate thing in life. Looking for people that make you happy? What is that? May we love like Ruth did. Those right in front of us in our homes, quite frankly, we're good at loving people across the globe. We're terrible at loving people right in our face, right in our house, <laughs> our kid, our spouse, our neighbor. Repent, let's do better. But the story of Ruth is not a nice story with a moral at the end, you should love people like Ruth. This story is not about Ruth ultimately. It's about God's love and his commitment. Ruth goes with Naomi, she goes into Israel and Naomi indeed finds her family and things are going well. Ruth gets married to this fellow Boaz who wonderfully loves her in the same way. And, and actually, everybody hears about how awesome Ruth is and how she was right there. And remember, Ruth's a Moabite. She's not an Israelite. She's not one of them. But they welcome her in as she loves them and serves them. And Boaz marries her. And she, remember what happens to widows and barren women and people have nothing Ruth has a son, and that son has a son, and that son's name is David, and then David has a son, and another son, and another son, and another grandson, and then in the town of Bethlehem, not a widow, not a barren, but a virgin, gives birth to a son, but indeed 
to a barren world, a lonely world, a world in a famine of good deeds and righteousness and love and full of death. And this son, a foreigner, if there ever was one, the righteous son of God, doesn't stay up there aloof in his white tower and just keeps on telling us what to do and how to be better, but instead, because you know what? He's a son of Ruth, does what Ruth does and vows to the other, to humanity, to you and to me, that he will never leave us, that he will go where we go, even in a manger full of cow dung, even a leprous colony, even a tax collector's house, even a prostitute's company, even a woman at the well. The whole story is about God loving women. That's what the Bible is all about, and heroic women. I will go where you go. I will stay where you stay. He proves it. And I will die where you die, where you belong, on a cross where you should be punished for all the ways you are not committed and how you've broken promises and how you have walked by the hurting. I'm going to take that punishment instead. I'm going to die where you should be dying on the cross so that you may be free and you can be where I am and I'll be buried where you're buried. And they buried him in the, under the tomb in Gethsemane. And Christ took all of our shame and all of your guilt because he is far more committed and far more loving and far more faithful than we ever will be, even more than Ruth, to you, to sinners, crazy, crazy, crazy love. And he sacrificed it all for you and picked it up again on the third day so that you may have more than he has, so you don't have to be in the cross and you don't have to be in the grave, so that you can be forgiven, so that you are welcomed back to a family of your own like Ruth was, and you brought into his family, God's family, and you can have rest, and you can have joy, and you can have hope, because your sins are forgiven, you're going to rise again, and God is your God. In Jesus' name, amen. We have installation here. Come on down, uh, Mr. Giuliani. We've been uh, served by him and his family since, I don't know, October or something like that. Reformation Sunday. Is that your first Sunday? Comes in during COVID time. Uh, I, I uh, praise God for how uh, the Lord brought you here, Michael. Um, like your first Sunday, uh, immediately it was like, oh, something else is happening here. It was just crazy, the orchestration that you were able to do, et cetera. You've been such a blessing here so far. Um, and we haven't even started. This is during COVID. This is during with our, we've got these awesome musicians. These are all our people, by the way, that you hear. These are not, we're not, we, sometimes we will hire in some brass or whatever, and we will be doing that. But we have crazy resources here. Um, you've done an amazing job so far. It's been fantastic. I do want to say this, though, that while we're expanding our music and growing that, and by the way, his job is worship directing as well as music overall. So St. James School, et cetera, just to, to just bring up uh, our music program and teaching at the school as well as in the church. It's a great connection for people uh, bringing them into the faith. Uh, but previous to Michael, I really, we need to give it up for... Uh, Megan Sleazer, who has done a phenomenal job over the years as part-time music director and made so many things happen and beautiful sounds here. So a round of applause for Megan, who's here. I really mean that. And this past year during COVID, the faithful roots of Kristen and Megan, uh, uh, Jeremy, uh, and uh, my son Sam, Henry, uh, my wife, Julie, really, um, here all the time. Uh, what a joy. It really was a lot of fun, and as we joke around, like, we really could have kept on doing that. It was really a blast, just hanging out and singing 
songs and not have to deal with you guys because you're not here. You can just watch on TV. But anyhow, this, of course, is much better. But really, God has blessed us through the years here, and we're building on that beautiful foundation. And we're blessed also to have Megan along the ride. We've expanded our music quite a lot, actually. If you think if you think about it um, but uh, anyhow I'm so pumped for what you you have and are going to bring here Michael and uh, please keep in your prayers let's do this official commissioning and installation here um, let us begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit amen beloved in the Lord according to the church's usual order Michael has been called to the office of director of music and worship at st. James this office has been established in love by the church to support the office of the Holy Ministry and to assist the faithful in their God-given vocations. Michael has been prepared for this office by prayer and study. He has been examined and declared ready to undertake the sacred responsibility and public trust. Let us hear the word of God concerning this office or in general serving the church. Uh, Jesus called them, his disciples, to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant. Whoever, must be, whoever will be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We're all, all called to be like that, but definitely church workers, pastors like myself. Do you believe and confess the canonical books of the Old and New Testament to be inspired word of God and infallible? Do you believe and confess the three ecumenical creeds, apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian creed as faithful testimonies to the truth of holy scriptures? Do you confess the unaltered Augsburg Confession to be a true exposition of holy scripture and a correct exhibition of the, uh, exhibition of the, of the doctrine of the evangelical church do you confess that the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, the small and large catechisms of Martin Luther, the small called article to tread us on the power and primacy of the Pope, and the formula of Concord, as these are contained in the Book of Concord, are also in agreement with this one scriptural faith? Do you solemnly promise faithfully to serve God's people in your office in accordance with the Holy Scriptures and with these confessions? Will you, trusting in God's care, seek to grow in love for those you serve, Strive for excellence in your skills and adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ with a godly life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you and you out there in TV land have heard the confession and solemn promise of Michael, who has been called to the office of a director of worship and music in the church. I ask you now, in the presence of God, will you receive him, uh, show him uh, fitting love and honor, and support him by your gifts and fervent prayer? If so, then answer, we will, with the help of God. The almighty and most merciful God, strengthen and assist you always. Are you ready and willing to assume this office and work? All right, come on up here. Michael Scott Giuliani, I commission you to the office of Director of Worship and Music and install you at St. James in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Please rise. Heavenly Father, watch over, bless this, uh, this man and his service, Lord, may it be fruitful. And Lord, we lift up to you our overall music uh, department and all our various musicians and all the work that goes on to make things happen, practice time, etc. Lord, Heavenly Father, through him orchestrate it uh, so that through these songs we learn about our Lord Jesus. We learn the teachings of scriptures, we sing them. Lord, and simply creating beauty to praise God because God is beauty and beautiful. So bless this service here and bless us as we grow in this area of St. James in the, music, uh, in the music department and in the worship and the various new services we're going to be able to start and all that sort of thing. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace and joy. The Almighty, most merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and bless and strengthen you for faithful service in his name. Amen. Thank you. Round of applause. Praise God. One more uh, note. You know, I got a good friend. We go to, we go to, let me say we go to parties. We go to jamborees or whatever, and he always says, people really just invite me because my wife plays violin. 
Uh, Michael is the same. We really just called him because we got his awesome wife, Agnes, who really rocks at the violin. Also, Thomas, I think, is up there playing as well. But she was right there at the beginning and plays marvelously. When they, the two of them play, it sounds like far more than just a piano and violin, by the way. So, Agnes, we thank you as well and pray over you. And you're cool for little people that you get to join here as well. And now we get to the wonderful Megan and some music. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, may we be like Ruth. May we be committed to one another and follow through on those. But Lord, may we be not self-seeking, not concerned about self-actualization, but the actualization of others and the fulfillment of others and the life of others, Lord. May we see others. May we let go of ourselves. You inspire us through Ruth and, of course, your son. But, Lord, as we live in the ways that we don't do that, we are, we are so thankful that we are forgiven because of your selfless act for us in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for the sick and the hurting and the broken. Physically, mentally, we pause right now. We lift up to you people that are on our hearts and minds that need your intervention. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for, we give thanks for the birth uh, of, a, uh, of some grandkids to the Welches and, and to our own dots and so just bless uh, mom and child, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for all these things, and we thank and praise you for all that we have. We, we, we are not grateful enough for the ways that you take care of us in small and large ways. Lord, in your mercy. Watch over, bless our president, uh, Biden. We lift up to you our governor, our mayor. Watch over all public, public servants, Lord, and raise up more to serve the public good. And one with the other, to be that system that takes care of widows and orphans. Lord, in your mercy. All these things we pray, confident you hear and answer us in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated as we pray, as we worship God with our offering. You can do that online or in person in various areas around here. Um, physical.
Thank you. Let's rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right that we should give thanks to you in all places. Uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. And therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Take the body of Christ given up for you. Take the body of Jesus.
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus, strength and preserve you steadfast in the true faith to life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this holy meal, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus, giving us forgiveness, eternal life, and confirming us your promise, your faithfulness to us. May that bless us. Give us the strength to be kind, loving, faithful toward others, and um, sacrificing ourselves for others. We pray this in your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. A couple of announcements. Uh, feel free to, after here, go and grab some coffee and some food and celebrate with uh, the Giuliani family of uh, the official welcoming of them in. I know he's been here for a little bit, but he's officially called here at... Uh, St. James, uh, what else is going on? Wednesdays continue uh, with the uh, Wednesday Bible study, 7 o'clock, out in the courtyard. Bring a beverage of your choice. We're going through Exodus. Uh, today, after service, we're going through Romans downstairs, just till 12. It's a, it's a short uh, little Bible study if you want to hang out for that. Uh, and uh, both of them, you never know attendance. It goes up and down. I think this last Wednesday, we had a nice, I wasn't there this time, and we had a nice, uh, nice attendance there. So, uh, Come and enjoy those times. Keep uh, prayers in your prayers. Um, our youth group, they went off yesterday. Some of them, our youth group is expanding greatly. Uh, and so I, I think we had, I don't know, 12 or so going to serve in Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, keep them in your prayers. That's good for the people being served, uh, but also for them on this journey as they grow in their faith in Christ. Um, and uh, and I, as I mentioned that, keep in your prayers our call for an associate pastor um, Jeff, by the way, Jeff, the White Songs will be moving, um, and uh, he's done an amazing, absolutely amazing job. Talk about self-sacrifice, that man has given a lot of his time for our kids. Before I even came here, right before, without anybody asking, slowly building things up and caring. Uh, Becky Gorsica, big on that as well as one of our teachers, but... Um, we're going to miss him, but our associate pastor, it's going to be a, a pastor overseeing our family life, not just high school youth, but school, f young families, high school, and just help develop that, plus other things as well, serving with me in many ways. So keep it in your prayers. We have a couple of people in mind. One person in particular will be coming and visiting here, uh, not this week, but the following week. So pray, pray, pray that we get yet another great worker here at St. James to join the crazy, craziness. Anyhow, uh, and it is crazy so but it's a lot of fun Sarah is it not a lot of fun okay <laughs> do we get do we get crazy on one sure sometimes sure but that's beautiful it's all right uh, let's sing our last song here
Go in peace, serve the Lord.